Queuing systems. We're going to start general and go back to um, specifics for what Baocat actually does here. A queuing system, just like a queue in a, a theme park or whatever, is jobs are submitted and then processed according to the scheduler. So you get you take your place in line, essentially. Um, it's more like a mainframe, the old batch computing systems of the 60s and 70s than it is like a desktop or single server. You can't preempt what other people are already doing. Yes. Is that a question? You use those? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I'm old. We do have preemptive scheduling. So we have some nodes that are actually owned by particular groups. So that, that means that they have priority access on that machine. And if your job happens to be running on their machine, then they kick you off because they bought it. So that's the way life works. But in the meantime, you get to use it for free in the me and so you're not really at anything. So the utilizing resources gameless Baocat. The biggest users we have of Baocat are people who have set up their own clusters and have realized within a couple of years that the really expensive part about setting up a cluster is not the hardware that's in it. There's a lot of hardware there, but that's not the expensive part. The expensive part is keeping it going. And good system administration, keeping up on the latest security patches, all that kind of stuff, that's the hard part of a system and security and all that kind of stuff. So we've had places that have gone through and bought their own clusters and run them for two or three years and said, uh, you mind if we just run on your stuff from now on and we'll just give you money? So, so that's, we, that's what we trying to, we started this on a budget of zero using used equipment and a few grants, that kind of thing is how it all got started. It's built up from there. We also have researchers that are uh, buying their own resources. I know there's some in this room that, that are in that group just from the names I saw that were registered for the class that they bought some of those particular machines with, with their money. And so now they have priority access either to general, to the whole, whole machine or to their particular nodes. Not saying that there's no D, no disadvantage. The disadvantage is that you don't always have immediate access to everything. You do have to take your place in line. This is kind of a schematic of Baocat and it's kind of hard to see here. Um, what we've got here is we've got the campus network. We have our Nichols Hall router comes into our firewall. And our firewall actually has four networks sitting off of it. Actually, we just added a fifth. So we have our management network, which is how we, nobody else has access to that except for actually Adam and I. That's how we turn machines off and on and, and do our monitoring, that kind of thing. OpenStack, which is, kind of shaky right now. The, the future plan is for OpenStack to be uh, a place where you can spin up your own VM, kind of like your own Amazon cloud sort of service. We're not, we're not ready to go real live with that yet, but we're getting there. We have a production network, which is our main, what we consider Baocat. And then we have a hosted virtual hosted network, which we're, where we, uh, we have a few researchers that have a particular Windows machine or some licensed software that they can't run on a cluster without paying ridiculous amounts of money. So we set them up on a virtual machine so they can run that kind of in their own space. Um, we have several different uh, types of connectivity here. Uh, I'm trying to think. The orange is, uh, is our fiber channel. That's very fast disk access. That's what that. Orange is InfiniBand. Normally, orange is, is uh, fiber channel. Yeah, this is our InfiniBand. InfiniBand is a very, very fast uh, network mesh capability. Um, it talks at 40 gigabits per second, which is you know quite a bit faster. Most of our other machines are down getting up to 10 gigabits per second, which is pretty fast, but it's also very low latency. So if you're talking MPI stuff, MPI stuff runs very well over InfiniBand. We have our regular network, which is in the blue. We have some other strange things going throughout like Hadoop, and we have a Ceph network for our OpenStack. Um, but it's not just like you'd see 
in a lab, something like this where you got a switch and you got a bunch of machines out there. It's a little more complicated than that. I wasn't able to get in more recent numbers, or at least not in the short time frame that I had to update these slides. But I think we have somewhere near 600 people on Baocat now. So you can see that it's gone up through, and we're over 2,500 cores now. I probably should have been able to get those numbers, but like I said, I just, I grabbed the slides from our last class and it was a couple years old and I forgot to update them before now. So getting new numbers is fast, but so we're, we're, we're still growing. We're always growing. Um, we usually buy more resources at least twice a year, sometimes three times uh, to add into Baocat. Uh, there are times we take the oldest stuff and we kick it out and we give it to other parts on campus. Um, we have, in our main network, we have several different classes of machines that serve different purposes. Our scouts are the oldest ones that we have. We bought 76 of them. I was guessing we have about 50 of them in operation now. They're eight cores, two four-core opterons. Uh, grab this off the website. Uh, eight gigs of RAM. There's some of those we stole eight gigs out of some of them. We kicked out and put them in another one. So you have to have some with 16. Kind of a strange lot there. Here are the Paladins. The Paladins have uh, 24 cores, two six core, uh, 12 cores. Sorry, 12 cores, 24 gigs of RAM. Uh, they have. They're the ones that are GPUs on them. So if you want to do any CUDA type programming with a with a high end GPUs, that's what we have out there. Please do if you have anything that will, can take advantage of it. They sit mostly not doing anything most of the time. So if you can take advantage of those GPUs, please have at it. We have the mages. We have six of those. These are our big monsters. They've got 80 cores, eight 10 core uh, CPUs in it, and a terabyte of RAM. I tell this to other, play, other schools and they all start drooling because very few places have machines with that much RAM in them. They've got InfiniBand and they have 10 gig yet? Yes, they have 10 gig now to the, I don't think about where we were. Elves, I think we have 80, is it 79 or 80? Something like that. 80, we just got the new ones, yeah. So they are, every, they are from 16 to 20 cores. These are the fastest ones we have available. Most of the time when you have people specify something, they want to run on the elves because they run really fast on there. Um, we have at least 64 gigs of RAM on the 16 core machines. On the 20 core machines, we have 96. And sometimes we even have 384. InfiniBand and or 10 gig Ethernet on them. A bunch of nerd talk here, sorry. Baocat itself. How to get an account. Uh, Baocat is available to any researcher in the state of Kansas or collaborating with a researcher in the state of Kansas. Um, most, well over 90%, probably 95% or more of our users are uh, on the K-State University campus. Um, we do have some from other universities. We have a couple from Washburn, Pittsburgh State. I think we even have one from Benedictine, if I remember right. Um, and people that co collaborate with them. So we have some people from Michigan, for instance, that are dealing with some researchers on campus. All you have to do is get an EID and then fill out the account request page. And if you fill it out correctly and you get approved, which is pretty much a given if you're a researcher, then you'll get an account. Logging in. Everybody here is probably a, a uh, user already. Username, we use EID credentials. So we do have a couple times a year, somebody say, hey, I forgot my Baocat password. And I said, I don't know what it is either. You have to go talk to the EID people. <laughs> and usually we get a cheapest response like, oh, yeah, I forgot that. I just changed, I just changed my EIPS, EID password and it work. Um, creating programs. We talked a lot about the programming, that type of thing running your own toolkits. I'm not gonna go into that in any great detail, but we do have all the development uh, resources out there. So you can do your own programming if you want to. You can download your own toolkits. We've gone over how to install things in your home directory, that type of thing. We do have, whenever you log in, you'll either see Athena or Minerva on the command line. 
That's the machine you're logged into. Those are our two head nodes. There's maybe a few of you that get a pod A. If you're in one particular working group, they bought in a head node because they're doing some special things on there. I don't know if anybody in this, this group is on there or not. You'd, be nod you'd probably be nodding at me now if you were because you, you do that on purpose. But running jobs on the head nodes, we try to limit to one, CP one hour CPU time. We don't enforce that, um, right? Okay. <laughs> the rules change all the time. Um, so they, these are meant for like light prep work. Um, a lot of your pipelining stuff that you use in genomics where it submits the jobs for you, that serial part, until you go serial and parallel, serial and parallel, serial. A lot of times that serial, serial part is not real heavy duty workload stuff. So we'll run those on the head nodes and let it submit the jobs, that's fine. And used mostly for testing. I mean, if you've got a program that's gonna run for 30 seconds and even using the entire thing, we're not really gonna care if it's taking 30 seconds. But the, really, I, the, the idea of it is just used for testing, get the test date out there, make sure it's working right on our system before you submit a job. Hey, cat tour. Hey, we already did that. Okay, submitting a job. Yes, it is. Dang it. I'll get that corrected before I put these out there, too. Um, we'll go out into the... There is a page here called SGE Basics. It talks about how to do all this stuff that we're talking about. This is what I was talking about. Um, the, I try to lead you through step by step on this because I know that when I first got started, personally, I had lots of Linux experience, so that part wasn't the stumbling block for me. But when I first came here, I'd never used a queuing system, anything like that. So this was kind of the hurdle for me. So I just kind of wrote up some documentation on how to make this happen. Um, we use the QSub command to submit to our schedule. Our schedule is called Grid Engine. Sometimes we call it SGE for Sun Grid Engine, which is where it came from. Um, although technically we got the fork of it, which is now Sun of Grid Engine. So we call it SGE or Grid Engine. Um, that's, that's our queuing system. There are several different queuing systems out there that all do essentially the same thing. If you come from other universities, you might have seen Torque and Maui or PBS, Slurm. Yeah, there's, there's several of them out there. They all essentially operate in the same way. They're, they're ways of scheduling system, scheduling resources, mapping that onto the system. Basically, if you can think of having a giant spreadsheet of all your resources out here along the top, and all the people who want resources out here along the side and try to map those up. That's what it does. It tries to say, you asked for eight cores and 16 gigs of RAM. I can fit that in over here. That's what it does. Or it might say, I can get you in anywhere for a while, but I'll be able to in over here. And so it kind of reserve your spot there. That's, that's what the idea behind a scheduler is. So, I'm not gonna read to you. I try to do that very limitedly. I doubted it a little bit there, but here's a, here's a Q sub command that might, for an example here, I created a one called myhost.sh, which just echoes the host name. I, Q sub it with a time limit of 60 seconds because I know this isn't gonna run very long. I used the minimum amount of memory possible, one processor, and I ran it. And all that does is it submits it to the queue and, and echoes the, and brings the, the host name back out. Your output, whereas your, yes. Between a queue and which queue you submit to? You can. However, if you give it the correct resources, it will do a better job scheduling it for you than you probably can yourself. Because it's going to try to optimize that for wherever it, it'll fit. So if you tell it what resources you need, you tell it how much RAM you need, you need to tell it how many cores you need, 
how long you need it for, it will schedule that for you. That is its job is to schedule it for you. Uh, we have people that try to tell it, use the, matter of fact, we had somebody just today tried to use a specific host. Well, that host was busy, so the job is going to sit there forever, and it could have already been finished somewhere else. So that's, that's the reason why you tell it what resources you need as opposed to which machines that you want, by and large. Just an example, they tried to use the well, the have a lot of memory. We do we do that part automatically. So here's what I did. I created the file, I submitted my job, and it popped back up because it can schedule that just about anywhere. When I did that, this is what I started off to begin with. I started off with just when I listed, I could, I could see my host.sh. Now when I do the listing afterwards, I see all these other files that it creates. It creates O files, E files, PE files, and PO files. Those are for output, error, Parallel error, parallel output. And if you look at them, usually, when you run something on the command line, it'll just send text back to you. Well, these are happening on other machines, so that's not going to work out so well. So what those do is this, that sends it to these files when you, when you Q-sub. And, and if you take a look at them, and I didn't show it on here. Yeah, we, we kind of go with that. I said, cat, this file name. I did it in the, in the order I wanted to on purpose. And it shows nothing. So that file was empty. That file empty. That file was empty. But now, when I did the last one, my output file, you'll see that it has, it, that's the output that would have come on the screen if I was running it interactively. When you put it in batch mode, your errors are going to go into one file, your output's going to go in the other. Sometimes we'll have people come in and they'll say, I don't have any output. Well, you check your error file. It'll, be, it'll tell you in the error file that something went wrong. So that's where you really need to look for these. We also have some ways of monitoring jobs. Um, the status command will tell you that things are, are running and what's waiting. I actually created jobs in particular so that one would be running and one would not be running so that I could make this example up. Um, but the status command will, will tell you what's running and what's not, what's waiting and how and when it was submitted, when it was running up here. And status-r will give you a relative time. So it's saying it started 27 seconds ago in this case. The question people want to know is when my job is going to start, which I think is really a silly question to ask because the real question you want to know is when will my job end? That's, <laughs> you don't care when it starts. You want to know how soon is my job going to run. But they are related, so I can understand that. <clears throat> so I just took a – we have a command out there called QStat, and QStat will tell you just about everything you want to know about what's going on. So I took at this point in time before I was writing this article – and I just ran a QStat command and I edited stuff out. I could put some things in here, kind of some boring parts, just so we can kind of see some, some things that were running at the time. So anything with the lowercase r in this column, in the state column, means it's running. The capital R over here means it was resubmitted, right? So they're rerunning, yeah. So something went wrong with it the first time and automatically restarted the job. So the capital R means it was it was resubmitted. 
So something went wrong and it's doing it again. Well, lowercase r means it's actually running. So it's running basically for the second time is what it's telling you here. It's what? Still running, yes. Um, we get down here to the QW. This is where your jobs will be when they're waiting. That means it's queued and waiting. The Q and W means queued and waiting. Down here, you'll see another strange one. HRQ, that means it's queued, it's been resubmitted, and it's on hold. I don't know if they did something themselves or if we did something for that person right at that point. Yeah. There are times we'll put jobs on hold. We'll suspend jobs saying, hey, you can't do that. We just kind of keep an eye on things and make sure that you're asking for roughly what you are. We don't have any. There are queuing systems out there. Matter of fact, we can enforce this on ours that you can say, I want eight gigs of RAM. And if you use eight gigs and one byte, it'll shut your job off and say, you're done. You ask for more than what you want to do. We don't do that here. We kind of go on the honor system of, uh, you said this is how much you're going to use. We're going to trust that you're using about that. But if you don't, then we're going to shut you off. And another one, this one is also put on hold for some reason or other. But most everything you see is going to be either QW or R. That's queued and waiting or running. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to make good estimates. <laughs> I didn't have, we could, I haven't, I don't have that on my thing, but we ask us here, well, we can go through it, yeah. So the basic way to do that is after you're done, when you get the job number, uh, you use the, the command QACCT for Q account, and then space minus J space, and then your job number. And it'll give you a whole lot of information. Down towards the bottom, it'll say max DMEM, maximum virtual memory. That's the amount that you actually use. And so if you do, like they said, do a test run, because, you know, I've been working with two test codes. I do that same thing. I run tests for way too much memory. And then you have to see how much you actually use it. And then you have to see Give another question. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> By and large, that's that's the order they're going to be in. So the closer you are to the top of the QW, the, the closer you are to getting your job run. Job ID what? In the command line? Uh, when you submit your job, it'll tell you the job ID. Um, you can get it from here. This is that's what this this column is of the job ID. If you want to see what jobs are what jobs of yours are are submitted, is that what you're saying? Um, 
yes, if you, if you do the juice stack command, again, using grip, which is just saying, just show me the output. Let's look at the current view right now. Okay, I'm just looking here. Jeff Kummer has a bunch of stuff here. So we're going to look at just his job, right? Let's say, QStat, and you use the pipe. Then take the output of QStat and run it through the next program, which is grip. And that will show me just his jobs. Does that make sense? Are you Sophie? I, I, I guess from the accent. I, I, knew, I knew that Sophie was in the class. So. Do you have any jobs in the queue right now? Now we do. You can you can grab you can grab it from here. See what I did out here? So I just used QStat, and then I grabbed your username. And those are your two jobs. So be one one line is 185, 1180, there's a little 185, 12, 1221. You can use uh awk or some other command line utility to say, grab that. Okay. As of right now. Yes. Monitor node. Here's something nice too. But it won't let me, will not let me do it even though I'm admin. We'll see if it works or not. Nope, I don't have any jobs running. Well, well, so this is this is a nice thing. This will let you log into a machine that you already have a job running on. So let me. Just a second here. I think I still have that in my. Nope. And sage. I'm basically making a job here. That's just going to sit there and do nothing for an hour. We don't recommend that. <laughs> okay. Should start running pretty quick, I would think. Oh, I see what you're saying. Keep this up here. Make it as wide as I can. If the smalls will let me go. Oh, come on. You should be running by now. I'm not using much memory. The three things you're going to need to know when you submit a job are how many cores you need. Right? It defaults to one. How much time you need. It defaults to one hour and how much RAM you need, which it defaults to one gig per core. The biggest thing we get is people who don't, who submit jobs with how much RAM they need total instead of how much they need per core on multi-core jobs. So let's say I need 16 cores and 80 gigs of RAM. That's five gigs per core. So when you do your Q sub, you're gonna tell it you need five gigs per core. Because if I tell it 16 cores and 80 gigs per core, that's going to be more than we have available. 
So that's the that's the biggest trick is the biggest trick is especially for big jobs is you have to specify the amount of RAM per core. Right. Thank you. The limit for what? The RAM and any core? Uh, well, there's not a limit per core. You could ask if you wanted to mage all to yourself. You could have one core and a terabyte of RAM. It would it would do that. <laughs> so, so if but but I'm saying when you specify what what your memory requirements are within Q sub. You're telling it how much RAM per core. So you take, take your, your total RAM divided by the number of cores that you're using. So we have a guy just recently asked for one core for 30 gigabytes. And that's fine. That may mean that we just have Must be busy. Well, let me know. Uh, uh, 16 core L, but he needs the memory. Well, I'm waiting for this. I'm gonna um, show you. Need, we showed you how to do a Q sub on the command line from this page here. But the better way of doing that is to create actually a submit script. And I have an example. Oh yeah, that's true. But I don't now. <laughs> that works too. There we are. It's already running. It's running in L51. Okay, this is your question now. How to get on there? Now that I have a job running on L51, it's capital M for monitor node. L51. Should come on. Come on. <laughs> it's waiting for my job to get past the sleep command before it lets me in. <laughs> I said it was going to be ex answer to your question. Apparently, your answer takes a while. I don't think so. You probably ought to put that in there. Somebody could add that to the wiki. Just saying. <laughs> it is a wiki. <laughs> So we can turn it back if you screw it up, but. Yeah. And this is supposed to be the fast part. <laughs> The, ma the maximum CPUs. Um, if you have a well-written MPI job that will do it, the whole thing's about 2,500. I guess we do have a limit of about f of what, 500? 500 cores. Yes, we have P we have MPI spread available. Sure 
Hey, there it went. Um, I just did an install of Rails uh, a couple weeks ago, and I'm still doing some background on spot. I've written and run multiple nodes. Um, I'm working with Bidlu and also with uh, Christine. And so uh, I've done some work with it on the Paladins, and the Infiniband on the Paladins is much more stable. We still have to fix a few issues with the pin of uh, Should take a couple weeks. Uh, if you had a crash on you, we've had issues with uh, the queue logic in pin of on some of the elf nodes, which is the MPI. There are people with MPI nodes close to all of it. So I would, if you're doing MPI code, I would try running on the power of And it's not going to work very well for some of these. Um, it's only giving us about one to two gigabits per second of performance, but it's just seven gigabits. So I know you. Yeah. And if you do MPI within a node, that will work fine. Um, that's it's just between nodes. Which is the MPI spread, which is what she was asking, was between nodes. Uh, Okay, now that the monitor node is actually working, you know, I eventually got me logged into L51. So now I can use HTOP and see how things are going, or TOP or PS or that kind of thing. That's, all, that's the purpose of the monitor node command is to get you into a node that you're currently running on um, to see how it's doing. And that does what you to about 15 worth of time because you don't want people running job. So here I am, have my job, and I'm done with it. Make sure I got my numbers right so I don't kill somebody else's job. There. I just deleted my job with QDEL. <laughs> um, you can also use the QAlter command to change your, uh, if you, before your job starts, if you said, oh shoot, I submitted that with six hours and I really needed 60, I did that wrong. You can go in and change that from before it starts. The, re the very good reason why we don't let you do that after it starts, that's because it's really easy to game the system. If we do that, if we let you say, oh, I need an hour. Oh, sure, we can schedule it anywhere. No, I was just kidding, I need 400 hours. No, we don't let you do that. So that's why, that's why we, don't let, we let you do that before the job starts, is the Q-alter command. Um, Anything, oh, Q sub uh, directives. I have in my BayoCAD intro, and, I'm, and you'll have this when you, I, on, on the slides that I'm gonna send to you. Everything I have in here is in, is in this BayoCAD intro directory on my folder, which is publicly accessible, anybody can get to it. But I have some uh, Q sub scripts. Uh, Let's do less. By putting things in a Q sub script, as opposed to typing out the Q sub command every time, that keeps you from having to, A, remembering all the parameters that you used, and B, it's a whole lot easier to go back and change things if you need to change anything. So, here I have it. It's a sample Q sub script, blah, blah, blah. Um, because the directives that 
Q sub C's start with uh, dollar sign or hashtag dollar sign. Then I use the double sign here. So all these are comments that start with double uh, hashtag. And so if I wanted to change this, all I have to do is delete one of those and then we, it starts with hashtag dollar sign. And that's what, anything that starts with that is, is a directive toward Q sub. So this is how I tell it. I tell it I want how much memory, this is all well documented. Feel free to copy this over to your own home directory and edit it, use it however you want. That's the whole reason why I wrote it is so we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, Runtime. This is hours, minutes, seconds, or you, you can put the whole thing in seconds if you want. Most people don't want to have to mess with thinking about how many seconds is in 300 hours or something. Um, InfiniBand, I did put a note in there that if you don't think, if you don't know if you need it, you don't need it most likely. That's, um, we had a lot of people for a while so were looking at our examples and saying, InfiniBand, that sounds fast. And they were asking for InfiniBand, and that was actually keeping their jobs from running on somewhere the way it would run just fine. Um, same thing with CUDA. Uh, CUDA is the GPU processing stuff. So if you don't need it, don't ask for it. Parallel environment. And here's a bunch of things you'll likely see. Single one is the default. It means you're using one core. A single, you're using 12 cores on the same machine. MPI, there's several different MPI options. Again, you only do this if you're going to be using MPI code, otherwise it's going to blow up horribly on you. MPI spread means to spread it out over as many machines as you can. MPI fill means I'm trying to put it on as few machines as I can. And MPI, we have one, two, four, eight, 80, 16, something like that. We have several of these documented, but that means you're gonna allocate this many at a time. So if I had MPI four, 16, that means I'm gonna try to run, it's gonna allocate four at a time. So four on this machine, four on this machine, four on this machine, and maybe four back on the first machine again, but it's gonna allocate them in groups of four. Checkpointing, I'm gonna skip, because we're probably not gonna do much of that. Um, some handy things to put in here. Again, you can put these all in the Q sub command line, but if you're doing a lot of these, put in a submit script. It's a whole lot easier. Uh, CW means change, change current, current working directory. Uh, by default, all your output files and everything it looks for is going to be looking in your, is right in your home directory where you, where you are when you first log in. Most times, if, if, if you've been using BeoCat for a while, you're gonna have your projects in different directories, that type of thing. So this lets you run it all from the directory for, that you're in at the time you submit it. That'll, that's a handy option to have. So all your output files and everywhere it looks for data files, same. Um, merge output and error text streams into a single stream. Sometimes you have uh, programs that are expecting, for some strange reason, they try to put their output on error lines. They'll kind of merge those together. Sometimes it's handy, sometimes it's not, but... Uh, so that, that is an option. Name your job. That's a really handy thing to have, um, especially if you're running lots of different jobs. I know some people submit several different jobs and they'll be N47A2, N47A3, N47A4, you know, and so on and so forth. By doing this, you're not just seeing run my job being executable. So that way you can see when you do a QStat, you can see what the, what the job title is. It'll also change the name of your output files so that it'll, it'll be easier to read and easier to tell what's what. And then finally, we run the program that we're meant to do. Especially if you're running executables, so submit script is really a, uh, a good way of going about things about running your programs. Uh, it's almost, uh, is it required? Probably. Uh, for R, for Perl, for any scripting language, Python, that kind of thing, you just about have to put it into a scripting, into a, into a submit script, and then you submit this. So here's my uh, sample that I have here, and then if I was wanting to submit that, I'd just say qsub sample.qsub. 
if you look at our advanced SGE page, it, it details all this too. So this is all documented. That was what I had for SGE. There, again, if you go to our web pages, you can find a lot more complex examples, uh, array jobs, things like that. I think you're gonna talk about that in the next, okay, that type of thing. Um, some strange things, variable number of cores. You can do all sorts of strange things. Those are, all, most everything is documented on our, uh, on, on our wiki under the advanced page. I tried to make the, the beginning page to be really as simple as possible, trying to get your, just trying to get your feet wet and figure out how this thing works with the advanced page being, now that you figured out how it works, here's how to get the most out of it. Questions, comments, or snide remarks? None of the latter even, okay.